Okay, here's uh, me and Richard Engel in Afghanistan together. It's really not my best look, but uh, there you have it. Um, here's me and Richard Engel uh, together in Iraq. Uh, here's me and Richard Engel together in this room um, on the show talking about something that involved a map. And here is uh, Richard Engel last week in Syria. Uh, in extremis, obviously, uh, kidnapped and held for five days, along with his crew, which includes uh, which includes uh, Ghazi Balkis and John Koistra, both of whom we've also worked with on this show, uh, when we've had to shoot in places more far away and dangerous than our usual New York digs. Uh, Richard and his crew managed to get out safe, and the chance to hear from him the story of what happened and what it means, I'm telling you, is worth stopping anything else that you are doing right now just to hear this out. Uh, this is worth it. <laughs> I'm glad you are back, I am obviously. very happy to be here. Um, NBC's chief foreign correspondent, you have spent, um, all, uh, you have spent a, 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 your entire adult life reporting from places that most people have never been to and do not understand well. Um, can you just tell us logistically how this happened, where you were, and how it started? Yes. So this map shows the border area between Turkey and Syria. The yellow squiggly line there, that's the Turkish border. So everything above that is Turkey. The Bab al Hawa gate is the border crossing between Turkey and Syria. And we crossed through Bab al Hawa and we were traveling in this area. This is a very rebel friendly area. We came down from Bab al Hawa and we were heading into this area in the center to meet with a rebel commander. And we were traveling with well known people. Uh, it was set up. The rebel commander actually came to Bab al Hawa to pick us up. Came to the border to get Came you. to the border to get us. That's how comfortable people felt moving in this area. We were going to meet this rebel commander. He was going to show us his area. He said, I'll come and pick you up from the border. He came. We met him. We picked us up. Hello, hello. Then we drive off. V just a few minutes after leaving the border crossing, traveling with the re rebel commander and one of his men and our whole team, we got ambushed. And gunmen came from the side of the road, surrounded our car, wearing ski masks. They had a truck waiting for us and threw us in the back of the truck. Boom, the doors close and they drive off. Large number of people, they were lying in wait. It seems like it was a well-coordinated... It was an ambush. Okay. They were out of their area. These were government people yeah. who had come to the area. We knew it was government by what they were saying. You know, the, the rebel commander thought maybe these were other rebel unit because it was so unusual that it would happen in this area. And he said, what are you guys doing? Why are you taking us? We're, we're with the rebels. And he said, oh, you're with the rebels? And they started beating him. Oh, you're with the rebels? Don't you support Bashar? And he said, well, yes. Yeah, at this point, what is he going to say? Yeah. Yes, of course we support Bashar. And they said, but you dog, don't even say his name. You don't even deserve to say his name. And so we knew we were with pro-government forces. Our rebel commander was saying to them, kill me. These guys are journalists. They have nothing to do with it. Kill me. I'm a rebel commander. Don't let them go. And he had a bodyguard. So they took his bodyguard, who we just met. We just met minutes ago. And the rebel commander. They took us all. They loaded us in the back of this truck. Doors go. They drive off. They're beating people in the truck. They grab me by the hair and they slam them against the side of the truck. And... Um, they're starting their little bit of interrogation. They're putting duct tape around our eyes and around our, our hands. They drive from there to a, one of their safe houses. Don't know exactly where, but roughly in this area up here. It's a farmhouse. They take the, uh, the guard, the rebel commander's guard, out of the truck, kill him, execute him. And you can't see that happen because you're blindfolded or you can't of, see that happen? I couldn't see it happening because we're yeah. blindfolded, but it was the distance between the two of us right now. Wow. So I'm Clear utterly con convinced that it happened. Yeah. And then they were dragging the body away later, uh, which we didn't see, but we knew was happening. And so that, that happened in front of us, but since we were blindfolded, we couldn't see it, but we could certainly hear it. Then they took us all, including the rebel commander, into the safe house. He's telling them continuously, let them go. These people don't have, they're not involved. We're pretending not to understand any Arabic because we thought that was a better thing to do so we can gather information. So you we speak Arabic. Them. Other people in the crew speak Arabic, but, they don't, but the people who are holding you do not know that. Do you know, they don't know that. Okay. 
something that proved to be very valuable over the course of this, this captivity. We were taken from the farmhouse, we know now, we didn't know at the time, here, to the town of Marat Misrin. And Marat Misrin, spelled like that, is half, well, mostly Sunni with a small Shia pocket. Their intention was initially to kill two of us. They told you that? We heard him, again, by not speaking, letting on that you speak the language. Oh, so you can listen without can them listen. fearing that they know. Oh, yes. Right. When he went outside, this, our main captor, back at the farmhouse, yeah. and was begging his commander to let him kill two of us. And the commander refused. He said, there are six of them. Come on. Why don't, why don't I give you four and I'll keep two? And the commander wouldn't let him. Wow. There was one time they were moving, I heard them moving a, a tub of water, a metal tub, you know, they were dragging it across the floor. So if you're blindfolded and you think you're about to be interrogated and you hear them setting up metal tubs of water and things, I thought, maybe they're going to waterboard us, maybe they're going to stand us in this metal tub and put electricity. Your mind goes to, goes to bad places. But then you try and push that thoughts out. And when that doesn't happen, when you're not interrogated or tortured, you start to feel, okay, I'm comfortable in this place, as bad as it is. And then they move you to some yeah. new location. And every time you're moving, it all starts again. Exactly. Yeah. We were here. They wanted to move us here to Fuwa. And Fuwa is a place that is very hardcore Shia. It is very loyal to the government. It's mostly surrounded by the rebels. It's being air supplied by the Syrian government. Oh, wow. So this is, this is a hand in glove relationship between the, uh, the, the, the government and this, this very nasty militia group. Getting the Fuwa would have been a problem. And it's not that far. And it's not that far. Yeah. But they don't control the space between these two towns, the Shabihadon. They have this little pocket here, and they have all of this town. But to get there is a problem for them, especially now since the rebels are Looking. on alert. Yeah. And that's how we got out. One night, the fifth night, they decide to move us. They load us in the back of a car, back of a truck, a uh, minivan. They leave, they're leaving out this direction and they're going to do sort of a roundabout way I assume to get there because they were leaving in the opposite direction of the town and they got nailed. They ran into a rebel checkpoint, surprise checkpoint they weren't expecting. Stopped their car. Stopped their car. There was a gunfight. Two of the uh, keep, two of our keepers, two of the kidnappers were killed including the one who was our main connection. Uh, he was killed in the vehicle? He was killed in the vehicle. That you were in? That we were in. And uh, we got out. Were you worried that you were going to get shot even if in the vehicle? I mean, <coughs> you yes. were in a vehicle that somebody else gets shot and killed in. Even if it's people that you want to be shooting, that person. They were pretty good shots. Yeah. They didn't brass up the vehicle. Mm -hmm. They were precise. They shot the two guys, and that was it. Wow. So did you know that at that point that you were safe or that you were at least relatively safe? Do, Not did you know who the people were who had been shooting at the car? No, we knew that they were shooting at the Shabiha, that our, at our kidnappers, so that was already a good sign. Yeah. We knew that they were their enemy. Um, but then when we saw them, these are very hardcore Islamic fundamentalists. And they, you know, so the guy came up, he has a long beard, no mustache, turban. You know, we don't know who are these guys. Um, and we talked to them a little bit, and it was quite clear they're from the rebel group, and they couldn't have been nicer to us. Wow. Um, they were hard fighters, clearly good shots, and... Um, were they Syrians? Syrians. Yeah. And then they brought us back to their headquarters, they let us make a phone call, they gave us uh, food and water, and then they escorted us personally to the, uh, uh, to the border. Richard, the, the thing that is, to me, just talking to you about this, hearing this story and knowing what I know of you and the other guys in this crew, the thing that seems very scary to me is that I don't think you did anything wrong. It doesn't seem like there was any bad planning here or that you were being, um, other than being in the middle of a war zone, that you were being reckless here. I mean, do you I think you think did anything wrong? No, I really don't. I mean, we were in an area that is very much considered rebel control. The rebel commander, came to meet us personally, and he was going to take us into his area, show us the activities there, and then drive us out. Not that wild. I've done many, I had done a few days earlier uh, a trip into Aleppo that I think was much more dangerous than this, except somebody found out 
that we were waiting on that road, waiting, and they, they informed on us, and they set up a trap, and they grabbed us. Does, does that mean that a war that's in the stages that this war is in, in territory that, this, that you were trying to cover, is uncoverable if, if, <clears throat> if you have to cover it in a way that keeps you alive? I think it's going to get worse. Um, I think it's going to get worse because when the regime falls, there's going to be there's, there will be rest, there will be a lot of uh, killing between yeah. the Sunnis and Shias. There's some sort of civil and sectarian conflict will break out, and I expect fighting in Lebanon, just across the border, is also going to break out. And you may have a, a situation where you have Sunni Shia conflict in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Iraq stretching from Baghdad to Beirut. Wow. And if you have this kind of many militia groups fighting along sectarian lines in pockets all over the place, yeah, it will be very dangerous to cover. Richard Engel, um, you, are, you are more capable than pretty much anybody else at doing this. And the fact that this was so dangerous for you makes, it, makes me worry about the prospect of us being able to cover these things up close. But um, more than anything, I'm grateful that you're back. Thanks. So, welcome back. Oh, thanks. All right. Now you have to stay here and become a dentist. I talked to your mom about it already. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thanks for being with us.